learn lessons from history that can help us to move forward. So often on this show, we talk about principles for moving forward. When our world seems to be falling apart, the bullets are flying our direction, things are out of control, we need to march instead of staying where we are and simply allowing ourselves to die, giving up, throwing in the towel, hitting it into neutral, on the inside, spiritually, relationally, and emotionally, dead. We understand that living is not simply the act of breathing, but that it is taking one deliberate step forward after another. But how do we do that when we're overwhelmed by the circumstances of our life? One of the ways that we can do that is by learning the lessons of history. Learning about those who have gone before us, others who have dealt with situations similar to ours and found a way somehow to continue moving forward. We can learn from their lives and learn those lessons, applying them to our current situation and helping to guide us into the future. History is such a powerful, powerful tool if we want to march when it would be easier to stay where we are and die. Today on our show, I have the privilege of sharing with you an interview with someone who not only understands how to tell great stories from history, how to learn the lessons that need to be learned and apply those to our lives, but today he tells his own story of struggle and moving forward, putting one foot in front of the others. Today's episode is one you absolutely will want to listen all the way through. You do not want to miss, and we'll get started in just a moment. Hello and welcome to the March or Die show today. Glad to have you joining me and uh, really excited about the interview that I am about to share with you. Before we jump into that though, I want to ask you to do two quick things. You're already listening. You've listened to the intro. You listened to some great ads, some great ones. (laughs) And here we are, we're getting ready to jump into this interview. But I want to ask you first to make sure that you are subscribed. If you have not yet subscribed, do that right now. Don't waste a moment. Don't go back later. Do it right now. Subscribe. And then once you have done that, share this content with others. The way that this podcast grows is when you share this content with other people in your life, people that need to hear and learn these lessons. So please do that. I am very excited to share this interview with you. Uh, History is very, very important to me. If you've heard me talk on this podcast at all, you probably picked up on that. I spend a lot of time reading history and watching documentaries. Uh, My kids are always making fun of me. But uh, I, I love history. It's very important to me. And it's important not just because I find it interesting, but because I believe that it is the stories of the past and the individuals who have gone before us that really in so many ways light the way forward. We learn from their lives so that we can uh, put into the right context what we're going through and then understand how to move forward. So important, and yet it's not easy to do. Today's guest is someone who does that all of the time. In fact, Josh Cohen, who is with us today, has a podcast called Eyewitness History, where he interviews men and women who have lived through historically significant events, and listens to them, allowing them to tell their story, what happened. It's eyewitness history. So important. But as you'll hear today in our interview, he not only talks about that and talks about the work that he does and the importance of history and understanding it, but he tells his own story. He tells his own story of struggle, the things that he's been through, and the lessons that he's learned along the way that have allowed him to continue to move forward. This is a great episode. Very grateful to have on as my guest, Josh Cohen. Josh, thanks for joining me, man. Really appreciate your time. And uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a couple weeks. So thanks for doing it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on your show and uh, look forward to, to chatting with you. You have a, a very diverse background. I was just mentioning to you uh, before we started recording, um, you hide it really well, but you have a very diverse background. You've been into a lot of different things. Um, but how we connected was uh, we're, we share a podcast platform. Um, we have uh, some mutual friends that connected us. And your focus in, uh, in the podcasting world, at least, is history. And you know a lot of biographical yes. history, a lot of current history, what's happening right now, the stories of people. Um, but let's start with your history. Let's start with your story. Uh, tell us how you got into this, uh, why you care about history, why you care about people's stories, why this matters to you, and how you as a relatively young guy, you know, because most of the time we figure history people are, you know, about 85 years old, and uh, they've got a lot of books behind them and stuff. But uh, how, what, what kind of brought you to this point that you're doing this now? 
Yeah, well, it, it was pure circumstance, uh, Jeremy. So I never planned on getting into podcasts, never planned on getting into interviewing. I majored in business. Wow. Um, yeah. I, 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 I did have one semester as a communications major, um, and I, I have a passion for writing. Those might be the only indicators that I, I would be doing <laughs> what I'm doing now. Basically, how I got into it was I had a uh, – through a mutual friend, uh, I had a, a acquaintanceship actually with Michael Jackson's official biographer, okay. uh, J. Randy Tiraborelli, wow. yeah, and he's he's written – at this point, I think he's written like 21 New York Times bestselling books, um, just a, a really – definitely decent bona fides. And yeah, uh, sure. I messaged him just randomly on Facebook saying, hey, I know this is uh, completely out of the blue and completely random, but do you think I could interview you? And I, I had no platform. I, I didn't really have any uh, – I, I, I didn't. I, I just I, – and I wasn't even planning on really publishing it as such. It was just going to be for my own – my own uh, reference. And I, I interviewed him for about an hour and a half. He was very generous with his time. Um, and he actually took the time to call me. This would have been 2017. And he actually took the time to call me afterwards and tell me that it was one of the best interviews he's ever done in wow. 40 years of being interviewed. Yeah, wow. um, and he encouraged me to keep doing it. And I, with something like that, you know, once that happens to you, you, you can't, uh, you can't pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> right? right. Sure. So I finally decided, well, you know what? So long as I can keep uh, reaching out to interesting people and they keep responding and are willing for whatever reason to talk to me, uh, I'll keep going with it. And now <laughs> here I am in 2022 uh, doing it. Um, that was on that. And how I came to a uh, podcast about history was I came to our our shared uh company salem uh, and uh and they were looking for someone that had podcasting background writing background to 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 launch a podcast in addition to managing um a website called history on the net which i i, I do now as well yeah. um and all i i decided because like i said i didn't major in history i i i enjoy history um but not I don't know that that would necessarily specially qualify me for a podcast. So I decided, uh, well, history is nothing more than just great stories yep. and tragic stories, of course. But in any event, it's a conglomerate amalgamation of stories. And once I took that perspective to it, I had a direction that I knew I wanted to take this podcast uh this podcast too. And, um, if I haven't mentioned it already, the podcast is called eyewitness history. Yep. And, um, Excuse me. Available, as they say, where all fine podcasts can be downloaded, Spotify and Apple Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I only have to say that once, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, on it, uh, I exactly as the name would suggest, I interview or curate stories from people that were eyewitnesses to historical events. And um, it's a bit of a salad. Uh, the stories are quite varied. I um, had the incredible honor of interviewing uh, a Holocaust survivor, someone who was liberated at, at Auschwitz. Um, I interviewed someone who fought uh, a World War II veteran who fought in the Battle of the Bulge, um, which was incredible. Uh, and then, but then also more, um, I don't want to say frivolous, but more, let's say, let's call it light stuff. Uh, I interviewed, um, a, uh, a writer for Saturday Night Live, uh, who wrote Chris Farley's last comedy sketch. Wow. And we, yeah, yeah wow. we, we talked about what that was like and, and, um, uh, and that was, that was, that was great fun. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I'm at now, and kind of what I'm doing. Uh, what what particularly was it about the interview that that first interview that you did with Michael Jackson's biographer when he said this is one of the best interviews I've had in 40 years? Did he did he say specifically what that meant? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did. So um, as you might imagine, Michael Jackson's biographer gets many questions pertaining to Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, right. you know. Um, but uh, he'd written a book. Uh, which didn't sell well at all on the comedian uh, Carol Burnett, uh, and as it happened, I I knew about that, and I'm a fan of of Carol Burnett. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I asked him about it, and it's a shame that only the audio was picked up um, because uh, when I when I interviewed him, it was, it was on a Zoom call, and I could see him obviously. His head was sort of tilted to his side. Hmm. And then when I mentioned your book on Carol Burnett, I, I'll, I'll never forget his head just like 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 popped up like oh. This yeah, this well, isn't so yeah. so I so I, I suppose the thing that stood out for him was the fact that I was touching on subject matter that other interviewers didn't, um, and he even said that to me. I don't think I've, anyone's ever asked me that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, cool. That 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 might be a skill set. 
it's uh, it's interesting. There's there's what people do for a living, what they write about, what they talk about, and then there's often what they care about, <laughs> and they're not always <laughs> the same thing, right? Right. And uh, it's really interesting how you meet people, and if you dig deep enough, you find out what they actually care about. And uh, I, I do. I really think that's what a good interviewer does. Your your podcast, Eyewitness History, is is history, but it's from a very interesting perspective because you're not just retelling stories, which there's nothing wrong with that. I listen to history podcasts where it's a retelling of, uh, of stories. I'm, I'm like deeply immersed right now in this uh, podcast on Irish history for some reason. Um, <laughs> I stumbled on it, and uh, it's, it's been fascinating. But the podcaster, the host, he just tells the story. But your perspective is bringing people on who saw these events happen and allowing them to tell the story firsthand, which is, uh, which is fascinating. It adds a lot of color, obviously. Yeah. Why is it so important that we tell stories? A lot of people are doing it. I don't know many people that know why they're doing it other than just the commercial value, because people will listen. We're going to tell the stories. Um, but, but to me, it's deeper than that. Why is it important for us to tell stories? Yeah. Wow. Great question. I, uh, why is it important? Well, well I, I think you even, you, you may have even just hinted at it, uh, Jeremy. Oftentimes we tell stories and we, and we don't know why. Um, I really think that there's something primal in it. Um, you know, uh, gathering around the campfire and, and, and yeah. telling stories. Um, uh, it's our history. Um, and it is the most, I would say, visceral or palpable way through which history is transmitted, right? It's one thing to read about, say, the Holocaust in a yeah. textbook. Yeah. Um, and you'll, and, and you'll get your, get the gist and you'll, you know, sure. um, yeah. understand it. Yep. Tell you, man, having not to bring the <laughs> not to bring it down but um having a holocaust survivor tell me that uh, a a fellow polish prisoner told him that his father went up the chimney having been gassed and yep. and, and smoked yep. Yep. that just that just brings a whole it sort of pulls it out of the intellectual realm and makes it human does that make sense yeah it does make sense um when we listen to history or read history we we get uh, what's the what's the line from Braveheart? History is written by the victors, something like yes. that, right? And and there's a lot of truth to that. As you look at these stories and you research these stories and you investigate what it is that makes the person you're going to interview who they are, how how do you understand or decide that what you're looking at is real history and not just written history? Uh, that it we have to be very careful what we look at because we're learning lessons from the past. We're learning lessons from people's stories. We're trying to understand what we need to understand for our present as well as for the future. Um, history is essential if we're going to move forward in a good way. And yet so often the history we're considering is not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how do you parse that out as, as a historian, as someone who spends a lot of time in this space, how do you parse that out? How do you make sure that what you're receiving is is, is good information? <laughs> yeah, there, there's that line from uh, the man who shot Liberty Valance: "When the myth becomes legend, print right. the legend." <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, and I, I I think there's more. Depressingly, I think there's more truth to that than uh, than not. Um, well, all I can really do uh, is make use of the tools that I have, you know, via Google and so forth, uh, checking it out and making sure that the that what someone's telling me is true, but also there's a there's uh, th there's a great deal of um, story there that I won't get, as I say, from from Google. So, for instance, when I interviewed Vince Sperenza, um he was uh, the World War II veteran who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He told a, an incredible story, which uh, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll leave it up to our mutual listeners to yeah. check it out. But yeah. um, about getting uh, a dying fellow soldier beer. The the soldier oh, wanted yeah. yeah the soldier wanted as, as like a last drink um and there's a, a wonderful story that he tells um no chance that I I'll see that in a textbook so right. there's so there's so much of the story that makes it more real more human I mean you know the guy was depressed and wanted a drink what could be more human than that <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right yeah it's fascinating um I have served in the military I was in combat and yes sir it, it's crazy twenty years later. I've written a lot just because of what I have the opportunity to do, and I talk a lot about you know some of those events. But talking to other people who were in the same place as me at the exact same time have very different perspectives often on what happened because of what they saw, what they experienced, and, and what they felt. So 
um, it, it's it's so fascinating to hear those firsthand accounts of yeah. what actually took place. Um, history is important. It helps us. But you have a personal history, and this is something that you and I were talking about a little while ago that not a lot of people know about you. Yes. And one of the reasons I'm fascinated with history and one of the reasons I spend so much time invested in, in reading and studying and trying to understand what's happened in the past <clears> is so that I have a better understanding of what others have done to deal with the obstacles in their lives. I, I read about tremendous difficulties. Um, I was talking the other day about this, this phrase that we use right now. These are unprecedented times, and people say that. We toss that around all the time. But if you understand history, you realize these are not unprecedented times. Technology is different. People are different. Things are different. Uh, but it's not unprecedented. Others in the past have dealt with much more difficult times than what we're living through right now. But they figured it out. <laughs> and yeah. we can figure it out, too, if we understand the lives they lived, the decisions they made, and how they continue to move forward. And your story helps to that end. You're doing things that are important. You're doing things that are significant. You're highlighting other people's stories. But you're doing that with a story of your own. Talk about some of your own um, struggles, things that you've had to work through to get to the point where you can do what you do now. Yeah, no, thank you, Jeremy, for uh, for all that. Um, yeah, as far as my personal struggles, I, I, I'd listened to the, the introductory uh, episode of, of your podcast, March or Die. Um, loved it, by the way. Um, and I, uh, w one thing that I kept hearing was the idea of overcoming obstacles. And yeah. as you, as you allude to, I've, I've definitely overcome, try my best, I guess, to overcome one or two. Um, so I, I guess I'll just come out and say it. So I grew up and still am, uh, autistic. Uh, I have, uh, Asperger's syndrome. Mm. <clears throat> Feels weird to even say that <laughs> out loud. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, it's just you and me. Don't worry about it. No one else. Is yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, I told you a bit before we went on air here, uh, Jeremy, on, on my other podcast, uh, Unfiltered, I, I interviewed a, an autism icon named, named Temple Grandin, um, whose name I'm, I'm sure will be known to at least a few of our mutual audience. Yeah. And I actually broke the news to her because it's not every day one gets the chance to, to do that. Um, and, and also it, it gave us something to sort of, um, sort of circle around. Uh, so that, that was an obstacle. I think the, for me, the biggest, lesson lesson even that sounds pretentious the, the 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 biggest i guess takeaway from the experience um is probably to not paint yourself as a victim um so in your intro episode uh you say i think it was uh some people when the world is falling apart around them choose to stop moving forward right. Right. and the world doesn't even need to be falling apart for that to happen in my view all that needs to happen is you have to just tell yourself a story about why you can't do something and yeah, and, and in my view, the quickest, most efficient way of doing that is to make yourself the victim of your own story, right? Um, I would say there's a moral obligation uh, to yourself and to others to not make yourself the victim. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I harp on that a little bit because that's something that I, I, I really try to think about and make sure that I, I don't do. I'm sh If I'm... 60% successful on a daily basis doing that. I consider that probably a good, a good day. Yeah. We're all human, right? Yeah. But uh, I would say guarding against self pity is, is, is massive. Was there a, a point in your, in your life in the past where you had to come, you know, to a place where you said, all right, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I mean, it was a, a decision you, you made. I can, um, I can use my diagnosis and I can use my struggles as cover for not hmm. moving forward. I can use it as a reason. It's a reason people will accept. I don't have to feel bad about it, but I can do more. And so I need to not allow that to happen. Was there a, a moment in your life, a catalyst, an event, a person that spoke into that? You know, I tell you, I don't think it was so much a catalyst so much as just a, a variety of, of events and understandings that I had about myself. So like, one one way I did have, in my view, a, a leg up. Um, one thing with autism, sp specifically Asperger's, is an inability or difficulty communicating. Um, recognizing nonverbal cues would po be probably the biggest the biggest thing. Um, but the thing with me is I I am and always was compulsively social, <laughs> so I right, I, w right. I wasn't um, fortunate enough to engage in the sort of selective mutism um, or the not antisocial behavior, 
uh, well, somewhat antisocial behavior that pervades a lot of people with autism. Um, and I, I say the word fortunately, of course, ironically, uh, right. it's a, right. it's a good thing that I had that, that leg up. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, in fact, that was one of the reasons why I decided to become a communications major. My mom basically said to me, you know, you have a mouth, <laughs> um, uh, communications might be the way to go. Uh, yeah. and I, I, I tried it for a little bit and then, uh, I fell out of it once I, well, the, the, the college professors were a little bit too honest with me about the world of journalism. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, if it bleeds, it leads sure, sure. sort of an appeal to the, sen the sensationalist, um, dimension of, of, of the news, which, you know, they'd be correct about. Yeah. So I, I fell out of that. Um, and then engaged, like I said, in, in, in business administration, cause that seemed like that was a decent, a, a decent way to go. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, uh, in addition to, uh, that I also found boxing. Um, Interesting. yeah, so I boxed for 20 years of my life. Uh, I, I, I still do it now, not competitively, but just to yep. stay in shape. I've only recently gotten back into it. I've actually just, just lost 60 pounds, which is cool. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <It's very cool. laughs> if it's not one thing, it's another, right? <laughs> right sure. Um, but again, not, not telling yourself a story, uh, not to, um, well, you know, victims, I think, uh, I'm a deep lover of philosophy. Um, and Pascal Bruckner wrote a book called the paradox of love. And, uh, he wrote, I think I got it right. He, he wrote that victims become victims becoming torturers is a classic historical pattern. <clears throat> um, the iron law is, uh, when you are in the process of, uh, combating oppression, beware always of the oppressed. Um, and that, that means even if you just perceive yourself to be oppressed, you know, so I, like I said, I, I really have serious qualms with people that tell themselves the victimhood story. Um, and I'm sure you could, I'm sure you have a million and a half stories better than mine on, on that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think victimhood and adopting those labels, this is one reason when I talk to people, I, I express and I, I've had pushback on this, but I'll explain what I mean. I don't like it when people say I am a survivor. There are survivors networks. There are you know people who will will lead with that. I'm a survivor of this. I'm a survivor yeah. of that. To have survived is one thing, and that's important and that's significant. But to say I am a survivor is to adopt that I was victimized, and I will forever be identified with that. It becomes and your order, identity. It becomes your identity, and before we can move forward, we have to change what that identity is. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Actually. Uh, Tony Robbins in one of his uh, tapes, he talks about depression and mm. says it's you know it's it's a real and true thing. I I have it. I will never say it's fake. Um, but there's a lot of people that they say they're depressed and that becomes their identity. Right. They might have great experiences throughout the day, but if they're if they're if their inner Correct. inner mind is telling them that they're depressed, they're not going to remember or certainly not internalize those experiences. So yeah. it becomes a a feedback loop. You have to be careful what you say about yourself or you start to believe that. How do you tell people, how do you counsel people to to not become a victim? So someone has experienced something terrible or they're experiencing something that's ongoing in life. How, how do you say to them, look, I, ex I accept what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I understand it. You've been through this thing, but you need to move forward. You can't accept yeah. that label. How do you talk someone through that? Because there's so much emotion wrapped up in it, right? It's like, well, I feel this way. Okay, I get it. But how do I move forward? Right. I, I guess I, I don't have the emotional argument with them because, A, I would agree with them. There'd be nothing to argue about how they're feeling. Sure. And, right. you know, right. um, but I would, I, I, would, I, I would and I have appealed to logic. Um, like when someone says, how do I move forward from this? Uh, I'll say something like, well, you don't have a choice. Hmm. In a way, I mean, of course, you do have a choice, but um, presumably you want to lead a, a healthy, productive, um, happy life. The only way to do that, in my opinion, uh, and again, this is just Josh's opinion, uh, but uh, in my opinion, is to move forward in whatever form that that looks like. For me, it was um, it was just, uh, I guess, counseling my <laughs> my my mouth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, and, and I mean that being able to, uh, 
to read body language, uh, proxemics. I was in, prior to, to doing what I do now, I was in sales. I was in sales for 10 years and then I spent six years actually as a project manager in IT. In both of those roles, it's very much people facing and it's, yep. it's very much about connecting with someone and all the, all the soft skills that, that logic and a diagnosis should say that not only should I not have, but I definitely shouldn't be excelling in it. Right. To the point where that, that is my job, right? Um, and not to, not to, toot my own horn. I certainly don't mean to, but, uh, I was a top salesman at every place I worked at. Um, uh, when I was a project manager, I had very high customer feedback scores. Um, the, uh, the one complaint I had is I, uh, I would sometimes communicate too much to customers, <laughs> which my bosses shockingly were fine with. Yeah, right. Um, and, uh, and, and same here. I mean, in effect, all I'm doing on a daily basis is, is I'm communicating either it's via my writing or it's, yeah. it's discussions like this, or it's doing interviews on my podcast. Yeah. Do you think that your, your own, you know, struggles with Asperger's and, and the other things that you've dealt with have made you more, um, sympathetic to the stories of others? Hmm. Yes, uh, to to answer the question, S sympathetic and then also empathetic, because um, yeah. it's it's uh, I can actually come at it from a place that a lot of people can't, because having having had it myself, you know, um, yeah, I I, I do. Um, I'll, I'll I empathize uh, sympathize rather with anyone that's having a a hard time. Um, I, I can completely sympathize with their experience and you know life. Uh, can sometimes be quite difficult. Um, and I, while sympathizing with it, I also will still say, you know, you have to put yourself in a position to succeed. So as a, just a really quick aside. So I don't know if you have studied biohacking at all, uh, Jeremy. I, I have. Yeah. I listen to a okay. lot of podcasts, read articles. <laughs> Excellent, all of, excellent. All of Ben Greenfield, yes. <laughs> sure. Um, then, then clearly you follow it more than I do. <laughs> um, but uh, I did listen a little bit on on some biohacking. Um, so I, I do every morning. I do a cold blast in in the shower. Um, it's just a very quick, yep. ultra cold for about twenty seconds, and and that gives me a serotonin rush uh, in my brain, which is a great boost. Um, I figured I wanted something that was free <laughs> and yeah, that I could right, imp right. and that I could implement with no effort. I mean, I'm already in the shower, so it literally yeah. takes no extra effort and very few biohacks I would imagine are quite as generous sure. <laughs> as that. Yep. Um, so, but anyway, that little rant there to say, just put yourself in a position to succeed. Don't tell yourself uh, a story, um, or tell you, uh, don't make yourself the victim in your own story yeah. and put yourself in a position as if you're going to live, live your best life. Yeah, that's good. I, hmm. uh, as a, as a Christian, I talk about the concept of redemption a lot and, you know, redemption is, is taking something that is worthless or broken and giving it value. So how do you make something that's worthless or broken valuable? When we look at people's stories, I look at it the same way. How do you redeem trauma? How do you redeem brokenness? How do you redeem hurt? How do you redeem, you know, illness? How do you redeem these things that, that are so difficult to deal with? You redeem them by refusing to be defined by them, as you mentioned, by refusing to be the victim to them, but then by doing what you're doing now, telling that story for others. I can redeem what I've been through and make it very, very valuable for others because now they can learn the lessons from me instead of learning them the hard way, or I can empathize and help them move forward. It's, it's so, so important. It's so valuable. And I think if we look at our stories that way, Instead of as this is something I need to keep to myself or I'm ashamed of or I'm right. embarrassed about or I struggle with. If we look at it instead as a tool that we have that's unique to us that can be a benefit to others, there's so much redemption in that. And I think that's so powerful. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate you saying that, Jeremy. And I, I, I agree. I think I mentioned before we, we went on air here that initially I was a bit apprehensive to share my story. Uh right. For a couple of reasons. Uh, but chief among them is so many people have had so much worse than me. You know, um, I figured that spotlight might be better served for someone else, but then I finally made the decision keying on, on what you were saying that if there's anything of value for, for others that would want to hear my, my story, such as it is, yeah. I would say then so far from it being selfish or self-serving to share my story, I almost feel like a moral imperative to share yeah. my background. If it's, yeah. if it's helpful at all to anyone. 
Yeah. People are really good at telling their success stories, but very <laughs> seldom do we hear people talk about their struggles and how they went right. through that. And um, that's, that's so important. What are some of the big lessons you've learned, maybe outside of your personal experience, but doing these interviews with folks, these eyewitnesses to big history and, you know, big moments, um, whether it's a Holocaust survivor or someone else, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that you said that was important for me to, to, to have that conversation, the hour I talked to them, that was an important lesson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny. I was, I was thinking as you were talking. Um, so I had the, the pleasure of interviewing uh, Frank DeAngelis uh, early the, earlier this year. Um, Frank was the principal of Columbine High School the day the day of the shooting yeah and um we got into he told me a story of of that day um when the shooter eric harris was coming around the corner uh seeing him and uh frank uh, th there was a a gym door uh, the doors to the gym they were locked and he had this massive key key band with a whole bunch of keys on him and uh, the first key he tried opened the door, and this is as as the gunman is is turning the corner. And he said, uh, I, "I there's so much that happened that day that uh, I can't explain, and I just accept it. But I can promise you this: if I hadn't found, if it wasn't that one key yeah. of of a band of like fifty or a hundred keys, I'd be dead." And he further he, he sharpened that point even more by saying. Uh, Earlier this year, he was at a, a soccer game in, in the Colorado area, and a woman came up to him um, who ended up being a former student, one of, the, one of the girls he saved, because in addition to himself, there were two girls with him that he wanted to get through those gym doors. She pointed to her daughter on the soccer field and said, wow. if you hadn't found that key, she wouldn't be playing that game right now. Wow. And that certainly worth keeping in mind that there's so much stuff that we just can't explain. Um, I think one of the, one of the more suboptimal traits of the human condition is that we, we look for patterns, right? We we're pattern seeking mammals. And if sure. we, if we can't find a pattern, we'll, we'll make one up. You know, if, if we can't find a good theory, we'll settle yep. for a conspiracy theory. Right. Cause that's a whole <laughs> yeah, other right. podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that, as you were talking, that's, that's what I think, uh, most occurs to me. Um, what is a, a win for you as you do your podcast, as you, you write on these issues, what do you hope that people will take away from the work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, what, what I hope people take away, I, I hope they hear an amazing story that they haven't heard before. Mm. Cause I, I would have done, I would have done two things. Number one, I would have spurred at least some, even if it's a peripheral interest in history, Oh, I didn't know that. Like that, 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 that little yeah. spark there is valuable as, as you know. Um, and, uh, and hopefully I, uh, uh, hopefully they can learn something that they haven't learned before. Um, Columbine, for instance, yeah. tragic story, obviously. Um, and, uh, something that I think there's a, a great number of lessons to be learned from it. And I think it's really important to hear the on the ground uh, story. Um, as I say, something out outside of a textbook or yeah. Michael Moore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's fascinating, and you're doing important work, even if Thank it you. is simply to archive these stories that no one else is um, allowing to be told. It's so important that we have these and uh, appreciate what you're doing. Where can people hear your podcast? You have a couple podcasts, uh, read your work and, uh, learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so the podcast is called eyewitness history and we can be found on, uh, Apple podcasts, uh, on Spotify. And we also have our own website, parthenonpodcast.com, which has, uh, my podcast, uh, in addition to the other podcasts that are under our network, that's going to be History Unplugged with Scott Rank, uh, This American President with Richard Lim, Beyond the Big Screen and the History of the Papacy with Steve Guerra, and Key Vows of American History uh, by uh, by uh, James Early. Uh, it would have been bad if I if I missed one. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of good history over at Parthenon. Yeah, exactly. We 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 do our best. So. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify is the best way to find me. Awesome. 
Josh, really appreciate it, man. And uh, hopefully we can talk again soon. I know we're going. We are going to talk again soon because uh, we're going to turn <laughs> around and and uh, I have the opportunity to be on your show, which I'm excited about. But uh, hopefully we can have you back on here. Thank you, Jeremy. No, it was my pleasure. I'd love to come back and uh, look forward to speaking with you shortly. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Jeremy. Very thankful for that episode. Uh, definitely an episode you want to share with others. So important. The lessons learned. <laughs> so important. History is significant. The ability to learn from others is significant. But also, learning from our own stories. Telling those stories so that those stories of hurt and brokenness in our lives can be used to be a benefit to others. So important. Uh, appreciate Josh coming on. Please go and check out his podcast, Eyewitness History. You can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, Eyewitness History. He has another podcast as well, the Unfiltered Podcast. Check that out. Um, Eyewitness History, I'll, I'll pause real quick. He mentioned this, but that can be found, again, anywhere you listen to podcasts, but also uh, on Parthenon, the Parthenon uh, Podcast Network history podcasts, um, incredible podcasts. We, we share, uh, I'm not on Parthenon, but the Salem Podcast Network and Salem Media. Um, uh, wonderful, wonderful platform. Go and check out Parthenon. Check out his podcast and the others that are there. And while you're there, go over to Life Audio, lifeaudio.com. Uh, that's where my podcast is. You probably found it there. If you didn't, you need to jump over there. Check out the other podcasts that you'll find there as well. Uh, so much great content, and I would encourage you to check that out. Look at Parthenon and then go to lifeaudio.com. Great, great shows you don't want to miss and excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much for listening. I'll remind you today as I do uh, every single episode and man, just loved hearing Josh talk and talk about history and the importance of it, telling a story and moving forward and what that means. We all have stories. We all have a history. We all have trials and difficulties, things we've been through. The question is, what are you going to do when those moments come? What are you going to do? Will you stay where you are and die, kicking it into neutral, <laughs> just deciding it's it's too hard, I'm overwhelmed. Will you stay where you are and die, or will you march? The choice is always yours. Choose to march. Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk to you next time. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org.